Well, good afternoon. Um, as the title suggests, I'm looking at colorful networks, pigments as a commodity. Um, Iava Varas Prokremnos is a late PPNB site in Cyprus, one of the two, as Alan mentioned, but it's a completely and utterly unique kind of site. Um, it is not a village. It is a task-oriented site. Uh, and I'm going to run through some of the reasons why I think so, and based on the evidences that we have found. Um, and it's actually, to my mind, does prevent, uh, present evidence of that kind of trading situation that Alan suggested might actually be missing from Cyprus. So, what do you do? Oh, arrows, maybe? Sorry, how do you move it on? Now oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, Allah the Alan uh, Andrew Sherritt uh, volume, Trade in the Beginning of Agriculture. Um, I happen to be one of those who's a little bored with domestication. Um, the Neolithic was also a lot about objects, materials, the exotica. Uh, and given Ayavavara, the things that have been produced from Ayavavara, that's where I like to focus. Um, I'm splitting this into basically the tangible objects. We know about the obsidian. We've just been hearing about some of the central uh, materials. I've also been very interested to hear about uh, chert being traded in the central areas of the Mediterranean as well. Um, here's an example of um, from Ibanez et al. Uh, showing the PPN B obsidian networks, and basically Cyprus is still left off. Okay, <laughs> if we look at a more recent one from Carter et al., at least we see Cyprus being kind of actively involved in terms of amounts of obsidian but it's a crawl to get to the idea that people are interacting. Even though we're allowing the animals to be going back and forth or coming in repeatedly, we still aren't letting anyone go off the island. Um, this is a unique one I was interested to hear earlier that the obsidian is really linked in the central Mediterranean to uh, the Neolithic. This is actually an upper Paleolithic example of an early exchange in Israel. Okay, Chert. Um, I was very interested, as I said, to hear about the chert in the middle of uh, the Mediterranean. I have often suggested that chert might have been one of those commodities very much valued from Cyprus, particularly those ones over here in the lower right. Extremely high quality, what you would call flint. Um, our geologists call it chert, so I stick with that. Um, it, this is only some of the color variety we have on the island. What we have here is at the boundary of the purple, which is the pillar lavas, and the green, which is the left kind of chert bearing zone. In our funny little shaped um, survey area, we have recorded some 45 chert sources. And as you can see with my nice little star there, the site of Ayavavara is plunked right in the middle of two big concentrations. All right, one of the main things they were looking at there before we get to the pigments was also clearly chert. Um, Sally Stewart, who has done a little bit of NAA analysis, has begun to try to interpret uh, these chirts coming into the site from the various chert sources and napping sites and, and other um, occupation type sites and to understand how people might have been using the landscape. Um, also, these blue squares, are they're, they're actually actively using we call them blobs, pillow lava, big pieces of pillow lava to help them orient themselves around the landscape. And you can actually link up a whole set of uh, sites where you can see one to the next to the next, uh, which is really quite interesting. Now, where's my little thing? Okay, arrowheads. Now, this is why I actually believe in Chert moving off the island. Um, there you have a nice little set of arrowheads from Gobleke Tepe. Um, and they have a uh, picture published here. Most of the Levantine material is gray, it's brown, and varieties thereof, with the exception of the nice purple-pink material. These red examples are clearly distinct, and they are mirroring, mirroring very closely with the materials we've got from Ayavavara. So that whole set of arrowheads is coming from Ayavavara. Alan has already mentioned the picrolite, which is the little uh, funny drilled thing over on the side there. They were making ornaments with it. I also think we should be looking at this as a commodity. It's never been tested. Um, clearly, thanks to uh, Daniela bar Yosef et al., we have an acknowledgement that green objects were becoming quite important with uh, the Neolithic. 
I have seen things called steatite from mainland reports that really look like picrolite. And since picrolite was often called steatite originally, I think we should actually check that one. Um, oops. OK, as Alan had noted, here is the uh, inclusion of Cyprus right at the beginning of the PPNB period. This is not showing the actual PPNA, which is the most recent materials. Um, what I wanted to pull out with this is the somewhat less tangible things. Stone is easy in a sense. You can actually source it, get chemical signatures. Then you get into um, the less tangible in the sense that the objects are dead, the trees and the, or the plants and the animals, but you can still at least do genetic um, analysis and so on and so forth. The obsidian at the bottom is considered to be the only other import to the island in the Neolithic, aside from the Cornelian that Alan has pointed to. And then basically we're talking in this middle group here um, of ideas that have come across rather than actual commodities. But if we look at the landscape of Cyprus, here we are right in the little area near Ayavavara, um, with the pillar lavas shown again in the purple and the green with left car formations. Up in the uh, upper left there, you see we have stratified above the pillar lavas the umbers, and they're massive. <laughs> and then stratified with the um, cypress sulfides, you have the ochres. And what's so interesting about this is the huge amount and variety. All right. Um, though they were not using copper at this stage, they certainly knew where the copper sulfides were. Um, here is some work by my colleague uh, Cassianidou, where she's showing here, this is our uh, lower left, is our survey site with the purple and the green again. Just above is a metallurgical one showing with the two yellow dots the um, um, smelting deposits from uh, Matiari South and North. Now, Ayavavara is literally about a kilometer from that red dot, which is the, the north version. Um, and as you can see over here on the other map that is looking at the metallurgy, everywhere you've got those little cross thingies, you've got your sulfides. Um, and so they've put themselves exactly in the right place to collect this material. They were not looking to be farmers. They were looking for materials. This is what they look like. Obviously, these are modern pits, but um, we, for example, in the upper left, were chasing a chert seam and came across this middle picture where you could see the back end of the Mathiari north uh, slag heaps. And it's quite obvious that these boulders are popping out all over the place. Plus, we found little streams that were yellow and you know the materials visible in the landscape. They would have had an easy time finding it. Uh, over in the lower right, you can see the amazing amount of color that we've got. You don't have to cook it. It's there. It's natural. Um, and then my two colleagues walking down into the Mathiati South. Um, it is massive and an amazing hypermarket of color. This is Aya Vivara, just very quickly to show you that, you know, what's going on at the site. This isn't a village. It's a non-continuous occupation. The earliest structure in the lower right, um, probably going to about 9,000. We haven't dated it yet completely, but it's sealed by a level at 8,900. The little object on the side there is the earliest figurine in Cyprus. It did actually have a tiny fragment of painting on the back of it, one of two objects we had from the site at all with any painting on them. Um, but the important part of it is that it was part of an abandonment phase of that structure. It's then sealed by a bunch of rubbish dumps, and we get the middle phase, where we have a series of dates at 8.7 and then 8.5 from stratified lithic uh, chert layers. And then we have we, we, our figurine that we charmingly call Bab. She's huge. She's about 30 centimeters um, for Aya Favara, obviously. And we have clearly a degrading of the uh, construction. They're, it's not as elaborate. It's a flat hole in the ground with a bunch of pits that have nothing in them but a bunch of grinding tools, many of which have ochre on them. Ochre, in, before I leave, actually, this earlier structure up in the right up there, you can see. That quern was my great hope for the cereals. Turned it over. It's covered in red ochre. So there you go. <laughs> we haven't found any plants yet. The latest structure is stratified above um, an alluvium of parapeti material, which does contain yellow ochre in it. Um, and it's, it was a ball-shaped pit in the ground. Um, 
and it is contemporary with a set of working areas for picrolite, which I'm going to describe for you now. Um, this little funny clay object, the earliest on Cyprus, was its sort of token abandonment thing. And then this little uh, pendant um, was turned upside down, clearly as an abandonment gift to a small structure just to the west. And then our radiocarbon dates. All right, so working pigments, okay. In terms of church, uh, I know Alan said he's got the largest assemblage, but I've got 3,000 kilos, so I'm, <laughs> I'm quite sure we might have a, few, a little bit more. Um, the other thing we have is 20 kilos of pigments. Now, that's what you can pick up. If it gets wet, it melts into the ground, and so this is, is a, a small sample, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, here's some of the variety of the color. What we had stratified immediately above that earlier, the middle structure, was this set of weird white rocks, chalk rocks, which we had no idea what they were. This is, I've never seen a site like this anywhere in the Neolithic so far. Uh, kind of circled around at hearth type dead burnt rocks, turned it over and well and behold, there were ochre staining on it and, and beautiful cut marks quite basically. Um, so they were clearly preparing something which then needed to be perhaps drip dried in these little sterile pits that usually had little post holes here. This one we just haven't excavated yet. So I'm guessing we might be talking about the tanning of pigskin. That's the only animal we've got at this stage on the island. Um, uh, an example of one of the uh, ochre stained uh, grinders. We have got very excited about these in the beginning, but we've got over 300 of them now, so they're kind of boring. Um, the structure which starts as the pit, um, oh wait, I should go back to this one. Um, just beyond this area, you had a funny little hollow. This is a stage two in the working. Uh, stored objects, an upturned corn, and stacked with little grinders beside it and two beautiful big scrapers. And then down through several layers of little carpets of picrolite. I mean, I mean, sorry, pigments. Every one of these X's is, uh, planned pigment nodule we collected. Uh, but at the very bottom of this thing, we found like little divots with sets of blades, maybe a scraper, um, and then evidence of burnt pillow lava rock, okay? Third stage is over here in the structure, that last bowl structure. By the time they're using it at this level, it had made itself a nice little bench. This is actually primary material left in situ. You can sit there, well, if you're smaller like me, you can sit there. Um, you have your anvils to one side, your grinders to the other side, and a little set of beautiful grinders right in front. This little bunch down here. And then this weird pile of mud, which was completely speckled with different colors of pigments. Okay. Uh, so the idea being here is that Cyprus did have a commodity that was useful and wanted. Um, but it is an intangible. How do we pick it up on the mainland? Okay, um, this set of constructions is very similar to, these are two examples up in the top uh, left and then over here. This is an Atufian set of grinders with uh, ochre staining and then up here are some from Italy. I can't find anything in the Levant that equates to the working areas we've got in Ayabavar. If you know of any, please let me know. The closest I've found are these, uh, particularly Rupiro Diametri, or however you say that, the Italian ones. And then interestingly found a report on the um, useware analysis of uh, flints from Merebet, where um, Ibanez et al. again describe uh, the use of scrapers, blade scrapers, and simple blades with just a polish on them for working of hides. Now, the most interesting part about this is that he suggests this continued through the PPNA, but with the beginning of the PPNB, they started using a different tanning element, okay? So that could easily explain why we have I have of our plunked at the end of the PPNA, valuable commodity being used for tanning, and then poof, it's gone from the record, at least in terms of tanning. Um, that then, whoops, sorry about that, come on here. Then leaves us with, well, what did anybody do with pigment after that? And quite a lot. Um, you can use it as a hafting mastic, huge amounts of decoration and objects and wall murals and uh, statuettes coming in in our own tentaman down here. 
which is down to the late PPNB, clearly ochre use continued. That Ayavavara shows us a very intangible possibility where it was a really specialized use for tanning. Um, but those sulfides were there, and it's kind of interesting that we don't seem to have that exploitation going on after that. So that's an interesting um, idea to think about. Um, I do think people were coming to the island for things other than just the land, and one of these things could have been the pigments. Okay? That's it, I think. Yep. Yep, that's it. <laughs>